Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit podcast. I'm editor and producer Margaret Fuhrer, back with a new interview episode. We are getting a little witchy today. We're having a very witchy holiday with the renowned choreographer and performer and writer and teacher Liz Lerman. Over the past year, Liz has been presenting her newest work called Wicked Bodies at several venues around the country, most recently Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And you'll hear from her about how this dance theater piece explores the persistence of quote unquote witches over time and the power and harm of these ideas about women and their bodies and their knowledge. She also talks about why those issues resonate so profoundly right now, because like all of Lerman's work, Wicked Bodies is deeply engaged in the social and the political. Much of Lerman's artistic life has been spent looking at how the creative process can help us better understand and respond to the world around us. She believes with inspiring conviction in the power of dance to make change, real change in the studio and well beyond the studio too. Before beginning the interview, I also just wanted to note that Lerman will turn 75 in a few days on December 25th. So wishing you a very happy birthday, Liz. Here she is. Hi, Liz. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Very glad to be here. Um, Your latest work called Wicked Bodies was first inspired by a visit to an exhibition at the Scottish National Museum called Witches and Wicked Bodies, which had all of these sometimes grotesque, but often very powerful images spanning multiple eras of history. Every era has had its witches. What made you first think... I have to make a dance about this. Yeah. Well, it's nice to go back to that exhibit. A nice is a funny word to describe it because that's not how I felt while I was in it. But um, I, I was, I have to say, taken by surprise uh, by the, as you say, the power, the slyness, the pornography, the incredible amount of symbolism in all of these paintings, pictures that went on for, you know, 500 years, mostly painted by men, but not entirely, many of them by people of the church. And like I said, you know, when I think back and reflect on it, I myself am older now, and I've always been interested in bodies, women's bodies and aging. So none of that was new to me, but I hadn't actually been very interested in witches, although I should have been. But by the time I exited that that exhibit, I was totally fascinated. And I think maybe driven by my own ignorance in part, like recognizing that I was on a precipice of like not understanding, like, how is this even possible that I missed all this or that this has, that this has sustained itself for so long. And the exhibit included one wall of, you know, just all the deaths, each country by country, how many people had had been killed, not by the witches, I mean, burned at the stake because they were witches. And that was shocking. And also how late into our, how close in time it was to our own time. So I was um, moved and came outside and you look out over this landscape and there's some trees back and behind the the, the the sort of green rolling little meadow that's right in front of the museum. And it's, you know, it's not like there were witches there, but honestly, my imagination brought forward immediately, witches of all ages, just like flitting among the trees and joined with this idea, which I often have when I'm getting, when I think about making something, which is, I don't know enough about this, but if I make something, I'll know something. And that is exactly what happened that day. I was like, I better look into this. Yeah, it's interesting too, this sort of through line of of knowledge being at the center of this project. The idea of women as of witches, as women who know things. You've mentioned this in other interviews that the piece explores what knowledge is celebrated, what knowledge is erased, what knowledge is criminalized. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So Sometimes I use as an example uh, Miss Blasey Ford, who uh, came forward during the Supreme Court hearings for Mr. Kavanaugh. And if you recall, at noon, after she finished, she was a hero. The coverage was incredible about how brave she was. And by five o'clock, she was a witch. 
And if you go back and look at this and just watch it, you'll see the criminalization of who she is as a person, how she could possibly thought this, how could she have possibly brought this to the public's attention? And it couldn't actually be him that was the problem. And that's an interesting example of the nature of the criminalization and the nature of the power systems in place that support the criminalization. When in fact, the knowledge could be seen as actually, as it was at noon, brave, courageous, um, calling forth something that we are afraid to talk about, or we are afraid to bring into our midst. And often that has been the story. So that's an example. There are many. And, you know, it, I, I really, the, like a lot of the work that I take on of this nature, where I know I'm going to be at something for a few years, there are a lot of tributaries and the research, you know, you go off, you interview people, you think about things, you have rehearsals, you try stuff out. You're, I mean, I'm constantly testing in rehearsal. Does this thing have any, any potential? It always has potential in my imagination, but, and in the imagination of those that have gathered, but does it actually have any way to move forward in a, in a stage sense or in a performance way? And uh, the criminalization question I, I looked at for quite a while, just because the numbers of who is being incarcerated in our prisons right now at the most rate, who's being held the most, and for what reasons. As it turned out, it, that idea of criminalization became like a, a, a constant source, a kind of an engine, without necessarily going into deep detail. We did determine that we would do one story of one woman who was brought to trial and to see that all the way through, and who was killed for, for being a witch, but um, not all the rest of them. But it did sustain me for quite a while. I will say I found over time talking to people, it was always interesting to bring up the witches. Like for a while, I was hoping that the witches, they, you know, part of the, the thesis in the piece is that the witches are having a big meeting. And I wanted them to meet inside one of these giant swaros that I live near because I live in Arizona. And, and the swaros hold I mean, if you go inside a swirl, it has ribs, it has, it's a body, and it, many creatures live in there. And I thought, this is great, the witches would shapeshift, they'd come. So I went over to the desert botanical bar garden to talk to the, the person who runs the big cacti. And we had one of the best conversations, and it was he, he was just so excited about what it could imply. Because a lot of people see the witches as um, magical, healing, a little bit of outsiders, probably independent and capable of power. I, I would say those would be some of the, the things that people tend to bring with them without designating good witch, bad witch and all that stuff, which I don't adhere to. So, <laughs> Well, and, and, and as you've, you've started to say, you, know, as you worked on this piece for several years and as you were working, there was a lot happening in real time in the political arena in particular that must have felt eerily resonant. How did, how did things like the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the protests in Iran, the increasing violence against women during the pandemic. How did that all make its way into the work? Well, I have actually a few stories, starting with the, the things that you mentioned first, as to what was happening in Iran. The um, We had already premiered the piece, and I have a a person, a former student, a master's degree in, in design that she took some of my courses on cre creativity. We've stayed very close. She's um, Iranian. And um, she called me up and said, uh, can you please put this in your piece, Wicked Bodies? Uh, bring this woman back to us, you know. And I went to rehearsal because we were already and we were in performance. So rehearsal meant that we had just gathered. We were going to get the piece back together again. And we're going to perform. And we couldn't actually, quote, change the piece. But what we could do, because we circle up before every performance, is we could hold the and try to honor the memory of this incredibly brave woman and all the women there for, for a second, for a minute. So what does that mean? Does it change our performance? I think so. I think it changes who we are when we go out. Does it change people's relationship to the performance? I think so. Do I know? I don't know. And I wanted to be able to report back to my friend, Farzana, that we had done that. So that's a direct way. Another way was uh, after the, the, the ending of Roe v. Wade, we spent a bit of time in rehearsal trying to decide again, where in the piece either could we augment, change, shift? Because I think the whole piece kind of addresses it. 
but there are places where there's text and we did address it directly in some text where um, it, it, it started out um, crimes of the stepmother years ago, where we were looking at all the ways that um, different cultures use stepmothers as, as evil or be they, you want to find the witches, start with stepmothers and you're going to end up with the witches. And, and so we had made a, like a list of things, which eventually is um, stated out loud. And we did add performing medicine in back alleys. It's a little subtle. I think we could even do more, but for now. But finally, the, the really to the point of this was uh, what it was like to be making this piece during the time of Trump. And mm-hmm. I just feel this is a person of vast cruelty and domestic violence. When he got elected, I mean, I actually wrote an essay, which I haven't published, and said, oh, the country's now in a domestic abuse relationship for the next four years. This is an, uh, This is what it's going to be like. And sure enough. You watch the press try to leave him and come back, leave him, come back, leave him, come back. It's just over and over again. So I had a lot of rage. And so we built what we call the alphabet, the witch's alphabet of rage. And and that was like a direct thing based on how we were feeling, but we abstracted it through a series of processes that I've used around emotional stuff before. And that became, it's not even that it's that much in the performance, it's that it existed and that we could rely on it and that we could go back to it. It's almost like it was default movement that you could throw in when you needed something, when you were stuck and you had to get through something. And then later on, we might have like taken it. So that was something. And then finally, the decision to use James the first as the, as the, uh, of the many, many people responsible for the murder of witches. I like to remind everybody legally, all these murders were legal. The state is doing the killing. Which one should we choose? And I took James the first in part because, well, it's the James first Bible. And I wanted people to know that the, that, that Bible was by the same guy who was also responsible for a, a lot of these deaths. But also the idea that a single person can create such havoc. One person can create international havoc that's how that's how the current contemporary world played itself out in our rehearsals. Not to mention then also the things that each of the performers were going through in their own lives and how those stories wrap their way into whatever we're making. Yeah, I was wondering about that too, actually, because, and I guess it's not surprising as we've seen women's bodies under attack by various political establishments in pop culture today. There's a growing fascination with with witches and witchcraft. Everybody's doing tarot card readings and charting the planets. There's like witch talk. This community on TikTok. Have you heard of witch talk? It's well, there's so much. I laugh because when I started the project, if you went to a bookstore and looked up on the witch shelf, there'd be like three books. Now there's just so many. So I just think, uh, yes, it's quite a quite a moment. I I mean, I can think of reasons why it's happening, and not the least of which is the political climate. I mean, our young people are just so wonderfully dramatic as they as they step into the world and and uh, demand a better world. And uh, the resources on which they are drawing in order to help create a better world are not going to be limited by some of the rational forces that were at work when we were coming up. Yeah. Um, it seems like, in, and, and you've touched on this already too, but in these depictions of witches and other magical women, there's often the tension between victimhood and power, in that we see them being tortured and killed, but then also the strength in their bodies is inspiring fear too. As you did all your research, did the scale seem to sort of tip more in one direction or the, or the other toward victimhood, toward power? It's such a really great question. I'm so glad you asked. You know, when I was young, I used to make three or four dances a year. Now it's three or four years to make a dance. And some of that is um, the fact that I need more time. Some of it's the economics and some of it is what I'm trying to understand. This particular case, I would have been happy to have taken the time, but then the pandemic stretched it out as well. The reason I'm glad I took the time is that the first two goes of trying to get this piece together, the witches were victims. I mean, my construct was, so the first one was, I thought I, I someone was collecting witches because they wanted their knowledge. And I love the idea of it. And we got into it and it was really interesting. We looked at collections. We talked all about, you know, museums, we tried all this stuff. But the fact is that the witches were being collected 
And even though I was designing this liberation scene where everything that had ever been pinned down or held in a cabinet was going to be freed, <laughs> so there was a big liberation scene, the bulk of what we were doing was we were victims. And I didn't like that. So I moved away from that. And and then I went through a period where the witches were witches because they had survived previous extinctions. And that's how they had gotten their knowledge, which I don't think is actually wrong. I mean, we know that we carry knowledge from creatures and some of that lives in the piece. We still have a section where each of us carries the movement of a now extinct creature as if that is one of our jobs. But it took me that long to move through the victim place and my rage and my grief. And even up to the premiere, when we finally premiered, not two years after we thought we were premiering, but the actual premiere, even then I, I was feeling that there was a missing section about the relationship between rage and grief. And that particularly I feel for women that this is a this is a place where at least in my I see in myself. My, the speed with which I might move between those two those two emotional states. Uh, but I actually tried to make it and I couldn't, and then I couldn't figure out where to put it. So I stopped trying to do it. And I felt like that was like the last step of into this power, because now the whole second act is just spectacularly about the power of the women and the witches. Well, they're not all women, but the power of these people and the stories they have to tell and the kind of narration they want in the world. And anyway, it took me a while to get there. Yeah, actually, I was, I was going to say, I, your shows tend to sort of elude direct description, like, like a lot of good art does. But for, for people who weren't able, haven't been able to see Wicked Bodies yet, what did all of this research, all of this inquiry end up looking like in performance? Yeah. Well, first of all, everybody should imagine the most amazing cast, <laughs> just an incredible cast of, of characters and uh people who stayed with me all this time. And, uh, you know, they come from really different dance backgrounds and uh, they're different ages. And uh, they I really feel I came to love each other, really. And we built quite an ensemble. And as, as Paloma McGregor said, uh, as we were in our last show in San Francisco, we're, we're kind of a pickup company, but we're behaving like we're a company. And, and uh, that was, I think, a certain truth. Once the, once we saw we were coming out of the pandemic, or at least beginning to, and that this piece would be part of the coming out of the pandemic, um, I did ask the question, you know, how can the witches help, was the way I thought about it. And what came to me is an idea that we want intimacy and that we would want spectacle. And intimacy, yes, we've been intimate with all the people that we've been staying close in, but now intimate with strangers in a way, and that we would want spectacle beyond our computers because we've all been, you know, glued to our streaming services and all that. So... Wicked Bodies does both. It 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 starts with, um, you know, you walk into the theater, the lights are all on, the witches are all out in the audience, and so are the local dancers that we work with who are part of the beginning. And everybody's just talking. You get to talk about, you know, what kind of witch are you and what do you think about, uh, what's it like to be back in the theater, all the witches, but you're in little pods. And then all of a sudden, you know, well, there's a fantastic entrance and usually people shriek. <laughs> there's thunder and lightning and people actually applaud. I mean, it's so much fun. That There's a lot of raucous. Uh, someone said to me, it's like a rock and roll show at the, the first half. It's just really wild. So, and then they dance in the aisles and we try to get, I just wanted that closeness, that idea that, you know, the person you just were talking to is actually somebody who's right next to you moving. And then we have this conversation about extinction. The lights go back on. Everybody's talking about loss, extinction. What would you like the witches to carry? And it takes a real turn and it's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful section. Again, they dance on the audience, but they eventually end up on stage. And then from then on, we're... In, in, in stage on the stage and what follows then is a bunch of spells and you start to get to know the the, the different witches um and this idea that the witches are having an emergency meeting you start to like hear this and that's being called by the great martha whitman who uh, was originally in the piece she is my teacher at bennington and she's been in the in my company for years and she's now in her high 80s and we decided to conjure her. And so she's present on screen. And it's, I think, kind of beautiful. But she's calling us to this meeting where it turns out the witches 
one of their jobs is uh, they choose a narrator of our stories every 500 years. And the narrator that's been in place is a white guy, good, perfectly good guy, knew Shakespeare, helped save his mom as a witch, you know, but he's kind of lost it. I think he's a little, I, I think he's a little unreliable. His description of how witches fly is absolutely ridiculous. It's really fun. And so begins in the second act, the idea that each witch has a way of seeing human nature. And now you just get a series of individual stories where the witches are matched both to the kind of witch they are, but also to a narrative. It's not just the story. It's really like if Ruby Morales says, it's not just trauma that travels through generations, so does love. Like if we really believe that, if that was our actual narrative, if we had that as the bones by which we lived, we would be different. <laughs> we would be different. And each of those narratives comes forward in those stories. So that's what it's like. Oh, that sounds intimacy and spectacle and mysticism and storytelling. And oh, it's just, yeah, it's like everything to fill your fill your cup, whatever you want in your cup, there's something to fill it. The way we open that first 20 minutes, I know some people really don't like that kind of thing. And we always say to them, like they'll, they'll sit there with their arms crossed. And I say, good. I, I, t I said to the witches, just say, good, you're in the anarchist chair. You're in just the right place. Go ahead. <laughs> just stay there. You're great. Which takes, well, but I do think, and we've heard from audiences, it just means so much to them. And they're in a completely different place by the time we unroll the rest of what it is. And so are we. Mm -hmm. the, the feeling in the theater is just wonderful. And by the end, really shared between the audience and performers. And that makes me happy. Yeah, everybody's been invited in. Yeah. Um, okay, so I also wanted to talk about your ongoing exhibition at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, because people can still see that that's still going on. <laughs> yeah. And it's a joint exhibition with the visual artist Brett Cook. It's called Reflection and Action. And you were both senior fellows at YBCA for the past few years. Um, the two of you, I don't know Brett Cook's work that well, but the two of you seem to have pretty different aesthetics. But where is your common ground? And how does the exhibition reference that or build on it? I wish everybody could see me right now, because I'm just grinning ear to ear, because it's <laughs> just been fantastic. one of the great gifts of YBCA and the pandemic was to get to be in relation with Brett Cook, um, a person I did not know before they asked each of us to come in and be senior fellows. I actually wanted to call the exhibit twins, which is ridiculous if you see Brett, because um, I'm short, he's tall, he's black. <laughs> I'm white Jewish and, you know, we're, we're in the movement world. He is this brilliant portrait artist, but it turns out that we have a lot of kinship in relationship to why art matters, how we want our art to work in the world, how we make our art, um, who are our models for being in it or who is he painting and what are the nature of community? So we shared, um, way more than I ever thought possible with somebody whose work looks so entirely different when you see it. And uh, so the, the exhibit is um, framed with these conversations between the two of us in each, in each of the rooms. There are a few of them where you can listen to us, maybe talk about all the things that we like to think about from spirit to people to process. Um, so it has been a real gift to be with, with Brett. And, and, and YBC, I think, I mean, they asked us in part because we are active artists making work and active in the world, but we also do work within institutions and organizations and try to think through how artistic practice can serve organizations to function better in a way. So we did a fair amount of that too, why we, why we were there. That actually leads right into my next question because um, you're of course a professor at Arizona State University too, and it seems like your work there is often about cultivating exactly this kind of maybe unexpected common ground between dance and other areas of study and research. Um, in one of the university's promotional videos, you say, turn discomfort into inquiry. Can you talk a little more about that? I thought that was so beautiful. Yeah, you know, that's probably the first of many of these fragments of language that eventually I sort through and get to by the constancy of trying to either explain process or get people to engage in process or to get people to participate. I think, you know, for me personally, uh, with noticing that um, 
I had a lot of inner complaints and judgments and that when I could move these to a place of, well, asking a question, first of all, I felt better, mood lightened, and I could actually approach it, do something. Now I actually have a lot of artistic tools that actually help you move from discomfort to angry. But the, 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 the simplest one, let's say you're complaining about something, you know, uh, you just put the words, I wonder why, in front of the complaint. And you already, you turn it to inquiry. Like, I'm really cold. I wonder why I'm cold. Oh, the weather changed or whatever. And, but about more serious things too. I'm wondering why I, I am so uncomfortable in this room right now. I wonder why. And you can actually begin to think about it, dwell on it. And uh, if you're lucky enough to have movement practices, then it's not always the words that hold our ambiguity, the movement can hold it much better. And that's why I do so much work with folks that aren't, they don't think of movement as a part of why they would problem solve or want to live in the world through their bodies other than maybe exercise. But why giving them these skills is, and tools is so fabulous because we know movement can hold ambiguity in ways that words just don't. I wonder why I'm going to tape that on my fridge. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, you know, and, and the whole idea of turning discomfort into inquiry also, yeah, it seems to connect to your critical response process method for giving feedback to getting it. Why something in someone else's work makes us uncomfortable, why we don't understand or agree with that. And you've, you've used that extensively with non-dense artists as well. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Response. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the theater world is, is, is using it the most. And we just learned that a lot of poets and uh, writers are using it now in their creative workshops. Dance, yes. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I like to say you're never a prophet in your own land. Uh, and, uh, but but a lot of people are, are finding um, reasons to use it. They've tried everything else and they need it. Uh, they're they're disaggregating the steps. So even though there's a sequence that I think can help when you're doing a formal uh, response to things, the the values that are lay inside each of the steps can be really effective on their own if you uh, if, if you practice and play with them. I was very reluctant to, to do much codification around critical response because I worried that people, it would get cemented. But what I have found is quite the opposite, that when people have a sense of the values that are within it, then they'll be very bold. And there's all kinds of ways people are experimenting with it. Because it's really, I mean, yes, it's about feedback, but it's really about your judgments. It's really managing all the perceptions that we have all the time. In fact, just recently, working with a friend and colleague who's trying to address some of um, the way, the speed with which she states her opinion. Um, I was telling her, it's a little bit like a de-escalation technique. Mm. Like, you know, have your opinion, fine, but using critical response will de-escalate the, the, the need to have to say it exactly like it comes to you. And maybe in that processing, you might discover some things. De-escalation techniques for judgment form forming. That is, yep, that's what we all need right now. Yep. <laughs> you know, I use as an example my mom, who I, you know, loved dearly and left this earth way too soon, but uh, she did not like symmetry. I don't know exactly why, but she really didn't like it. So when, like when we moved once, she made my dad move the door to the house from the middle to the side. So if I see symmetry, I can sometimes get um, like – my hair, you know, the hair on my hair, something like that. Yeah. But, you know, if you're looking at dance composition from young people, new people, you can see a lot of symmetry. So what am I supposed to do? And who's talking when I get itchy? You know, it's my mom. It's not necessarily me looking at the work of this person in front of me. So critical response helps you get at this kind of stuff that you may have been raised to believe or you may have been trained to believe and this is where i think we get into a lot of trouble in our profession as just many because we set these standards based on somebody's aesthetics but they're not aesthetics for everybody mm -hmm. they're not and they shouldn't be and so we need to really think about why this person is doing this thing in front of us in the way manner in which they are and 
what what where do we want to go and thinking through what they've what they've done with them you know it feels like in the past few years the the wider dance world well the world at large really but the dance world especially has started to slowly catch on to principles that have been central to your practice for a while now like this idea that dance can be a powerful catalyst for social change the idea that dance should be fully democratic, both in terms of how organizations look and in terms of who is invited and welcomed and engaged. And then that related idea that we should break down boundaries between the stage and the audience and the theater and the community. Are you having a bit of an uh, I told you so moment? (laughs) Or what do you think has shifted in the social fabric recently that has led to these changes, rather? In the spirit of hoping that my early work won't be erased, um, <laughs> it it's nice to possibly see the threads to be acknowledged for all that turning of the soil. I think of it often like that. You, people till the soil so that other things can grow. Mm-hmm. And I seem to be a person who likes to do the tilling, even though sometimes I'm frustrated because I... You know, I'd like people to still keep seeing what what's also growing. And of course, I'm not the only voice. There were many of us saying this and doing this and insisting on this, not necessarily central to the canon that was emerging out of certain parts of our field, but certainly urban bushwomen, Jane Comfort, um, the work that Miriam Soto, uh, Joanna Highgood, you know, Echo. I mean, there's a lot of people turning that soil over in different ways. So I love that people are thinking about it. What is interesting to me right now is because I've been, you know, I think of myself as sort of an obsessive tool, a maker, like all these years, I've kind of documented these tools and they live in books and they live in the Atlas of Creative Tools and they live in the toolbox at the dance exchange and they live, you know, and I think they're really useful. Like, I think you can take a tool and it won't it won't make you look like me. It'll make you look like you when you apply it. But what I really think is that people have their own tools and, that, and to sort of the, the, the steadiness and the, the, the persistence of sort of understanding that your intuition is something that you can harvest and you can use over and over again. So I don't know, though. Sometimes I think people think the tools are maybe they're more like, oh, she's giving advice again <laughs> and nobody wants advice. But I'm hopeful that I can put these things forward. In a way, that's what the ex- exhibition is. Mm-hmm. Like when, when they asked me, what did you want to do with this exhibition? What I, what I felt was, it's not so, yes, I want people to see what we did. Yes, of course. I want you to see, look, we were in the shipyard. Oh, look, we did that during 9-11. Oh, look at this thing that we did around toxic waste in 1984. Like, look at this, one of my favorite pieces. It's way, way old, that piece, but it's really good. <laughs> But mostly I wanted people to come out and just feel bold, like, oh, is it possible? Yes, this thing I'm thinking, I want to make this thing about, oh, I don't know, the the oil spill down the block. Yeah, make it, make it. And also, it's not just the making. It's the creating the conditions for partnerships, for relationships, and for engagement so that it's not just I'm going to make this thing and put it on the stage and it's over. It's all the way, the multiple ways that we can share. Well, we're back to knowledge, aren't we? The multiple ways in which we can share our knowledge. And you're essentially now answering my last question, which is like the question, a big question. Um, Because at this moment of pretty great uncertainty and and darkness in the wider world, um, not to be too gloom and doom, but it's been feeling pretty dark out there some days. I think a lot of us in the arts community, especially sometimes feel helpless that we're just, you know, we're over here doing our little dances and writing our little stories. But you have often affirmed this belief that art makes a difference. So can you say more about how can art and dance art in particular make both meaning and change? I think that a lot of our artistic practices and processes are actually the capacities and skills that people need in order to live in a world that is in constant motion. So I'm actually working on a new book, An Insomniac's Insomniac's Guide to a Restless World. And it has a lot to do with choreographic thinking, sort of the way design thinking took over all those millions of years, you know, 
a long time ago. It, it's like the everything is in motion. Our institutions, our organizations, the buildings, the earth, the, the climate, it's all in motion. So what do we know that actually can help people? And if they would be willing also to come along and have it too, which means our educational systems have to change. Our, you know, I always say to my school, I know you're happy I'm at the school, but you measure knowledge systems by how much money they bring in and mine doesn't bring in very much, but I still know something. So it's like, how do we get people to be more engaged in these skills that I think really, really matter? I, I, one of the, one of my labs over the years has been my synagogue in Washington, DC, even though I don't live there anymore, but I go back and I, we, we did participatory forms of worship for years there, which always surprised and shocked me. It was something I just did on the side was, you know, and a lot of them never came to see my shows and they, you know, it's just a world. But this, this year when I was there for Yom Kippur, which is the, after, I do something participatory the afternoon, which is a, it's a big holy day in the Jewish calendar. And, um, Everybody, everybody dances. It's a thing. But just before it, this, the story of Jonah is told uh, every year. And this year, the rabbi tells the story of Jonah. And uh, this is Jonah's the one who gets swallowed by the whale. He's the one who's running away from things. And the rabbi says it this way. He says, he's running away. He doesn't really want to face God. And he's finally in the whale. And he finds out that, you know, you just can't escape God. And then he turned it over to me. And I always say a little bit before I before we start doing all the moving. And I said, well, because uh, the rabbi knows all these years, I actually have trouble understanding the idea of God, but I have come to think that the search for creativity is similar, not the same, but similar. It's magical. The more I understand it, the more I don't understand how come it happens. The more I create the conditions for it to exist, the more surprising it is when it happens. You know, it's just like, and the more I teach all my students constantly how to harvest all the stuff they already know, it's still, so I turned to everybody and I said, well, you can't escape your creativity. You can try. You can say you have two left feet. You can try. You can say you don't have imagination. You can try. You can put a boulder in front of you and say, but just so like you can't escape this idea of God, but I'm telling you, you cannot. And that's kind of where I am right now on the question you pose. Is it actually, it is our honor, our job, our privilege to share this incredibly powerful thing we understand. And the art world needs to change the system so that more people can participate. I, mean, I love the idea too that as you realize the extent of your own creative mystery, your faith in it also deepens. I think it's not in life. I've heard people who are, who are in mystics or people who are trying to understand uh, meditation and that, and that, that all, almost everybody says the same thing. That's why there's so much rigor around doing it and why there's so much, um, how it's so interesting to stay on the path and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying because it's really, uh, it's believable and unbelievable. And I can feel like I have a hand in it. Like I just made that thing. And I can also stand back and say, how did I make that thing? Where did that come from? Did that yeah. even happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz, thank you so much for, for making the time today. Thank you for your generosity and, and the depth of thought that you always put into your answers. I sincerely appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for having me and uh, for this time of year when we can all be together. I hope everybody has some time with their loved ones and thank you. Another big thanks to Liz, who is, I know you just heard it yourself, but just the most giving and kind interview guest. In the show notes, we have links to her website, lizlerman.com, and also to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts site, which has more information about that ongoing exhibition with Brett Cook. Um, that exhibition runs through next June, by the way. So if you are in or around San Francisco, you have lots of time to stop by and take it in. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a special holiday treat for you. Stay tuned. Until then, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. <laughs> <laughs>